All right, let me first uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm Ar Armando Chacon, I'm the president of the, uh, the West Central Association. Uh, so I am a business owner and I'm the uh, managing partner of the Section 21 SGR's West office on Madison Street. Uh, I'm also a long time resident and uh, well, my father worked on the for decades. Um, so I will be moderating tonight. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, Stephen and Sherry Garrett uh, for letting us use this amazing space. Um, I'd like to give you just some information on this space, which is available uh, for various events, for the weddings, um, various parties. Um, I understand uh, that uh, this space received an award uh, one of the better event spaces in the city in 2009. Uh, just, just a really, really nice space in here. So thank you very much. We would also like uh, to thank the uh, Ravel Group. And I believe uh, Clint and Patton uh, is here. They're located at uh, 440 uh, West Randolph. Um, well, first, I'd like to um, introduce our committee. Uh, Rolando, if you don't mind. Presentation about the landmark aspect of the city's proposal. This is really 
two things the city is proposing. First is a land use plan for the whole market, Grand Lake Market area, and secondly, a, a land, historic landmark district for a portion of that area. You'll see a little bit about it in my presentation, but you'll hear more about it in Cap's presentation. So with that, let's start with the, this is the current existing zoning for the area. You see the area that's been, is the subject of the plan outlined in orange. You essentially have a PMD district, plant manufacturing district in purple along the northern sector of the area. You have an industrial manufacturing zone property towards the west portion of the area, fronting on Lake Street and extending north to Carroll. And if you go east from there, generally the middle of the area, you see it in kind of a light blue color, and it is uh, commercial. And then Randolph Street, which is the southern boundary, has two types of zoning. It has, it has a downtown zoning on the south portion of it, and predominantly a C or commercial zoning along the north. And this, just by contrast, is the city's proposed plan. So essentially what they would do under their proposal is keep, and we're not really using the M's, the C's, the typical zoning district classifications that some of you may be familiar with. We're talking more generally about uses and providing some indications of zoning districts to give you a sense of density and types of uses. So the city has proposing in, in purple, or lilac, a manufact innovative industries for what is today the PMD portion and the manufacturing portion of the whole market, Randolph market area. Two, basically not changing much in the current zoning with respect to those, but trying to bring in some new uses. Now, the innovative industries, it doesn't really have a definition. For most of us, we take the, the cue from Google, which will occupy 1,000 West Fulton, and it's really an office use, ultimately where you have creative people sitting in an office type environment and working on high tech types of products. So without further definition, that is sort of the envisioned type of uses. Not sure they fully fit in the PMD or the M, but that's the vision. And the green color is what I call the historic old market area, which is the main thrust of the area on Fulton Street, and that remains essentially the same. That remains with C3 zoning, which would not allow residential, and a relatively low density, try to keep the buildings there on a smaller scale, and uh, more density type uses. Then the orange is the high density area as proposed by the city, which would be centered on Lake Street. So it runs essentially from Halstead to Racine on Lake Street, and their mind is trying to take advantage of the L. And then to the south is Randolph Road, commercial area, trying to envision mostly what you see today, which is some lower, actually lower density or maybe higher density uses, but more of the commercial uses for restaurants and those types of uses as have been developed. In all cases, trying to also preserve the opportunity for any industrial user that's there to remain. So this is not an idea of moving those individuals or, or companies out. It's the idea of planning for the future as some of those, those uses move and the properties get sold, what will come next? Uh, this sort of takes you through what I just discussed. And you can see a sense of scale in the purple, three or four stories, again, this is the city's suggestion. In the greenish Randolph Oak Market historic area, one to three stories. The orange, which is the height, is envisioned by the city, the high density area, could be in the five to 15 story range. And then in the Randolph area, kind of a one to five story scale you get some idea of the uses that they're envisioning uh, in the various sectors of this area. They've also proposed a landmark district. So this is just a portion of the bigger map, and it shows you the areas that are, the properties are going to be included, and actually have already been preliminary designated. So this area is right now frozen in time uh, until further review. But what they are proposing uh, for a landmark district pretty extensive, starting at Randolph, even south of Randolph, and extending all the way north to Carroll, and almost to, and out all the way west to Racine. My goodness. This superimposes the landmark district on top of the proposed land use plan. The one thing that you will notice, I mean, if you have a landmark district, in theory, you have to preserve the buildings. A lot of the landmark district covers Lake Street, which is where they would, the city's proposal would envision high-density, taller buildings. 
Well, it's very difficult to achieve that if you simultaneously landmark what's there today, which means you can't demolish it. And if you go block by block, we were doing this exercise earlier, you'll see that actually there's very few blocks that are not touched by the landmark district. So in terms of having a big footprint for a development, a whole block or a half a block, the landmark district really chops up Lake Street and makes it much more difficult to achieve. Uh, the WCA reviewed these plans and then decided it would take a step back and really try to figure out what's there today, what are the attributes of the area, and what should we really envision for the future. So we started with an overall map. Uh, we started with an overall map. You can see Randolph Street, which is a major thoroughfare going west by traffic direction, but cutting the district in an east-west direction, ending at Union Park at Ogden. You see Ogden, which is to us an important corridor because Ogden at the western end of this area provides access to, to 90 to the north and 290 to the south and may provide the means by which people can get to the expressways if they so wish without actually having to travel east all the way through the district. Uh, you obviously see 90 on the eastern ramp, uh, perimeter of this area. Next. I don't know if anyone had done this, but the WCA had, did this and is still refining the map, but this is a map of existing uses. So what we attempted to do was go around and try to figure out what is actually the property being used for today. And there were some surprises in this, but just to take you through the map, orange means commercial. So anything that's labeled in orange is either today used for commercial or is a vacant building that is being marketed for commercial uses. Purple is industrial. So you see some of the industrial uses that are uh, sort of aggregated towards the north and, and to some extent in the historical market area. Red is residential in this map. And to the extent that a building had residential on the upper floors or ground floor commercial, the residential was really the main use or the predominant use, we label it based on the predominant use. And it's going to get a little complicated if you have to start using stripes in the white on the map. Uh, Blue is vacant, green is parking, so these are parcels that are used today for parking, not necessarily public parking, but just large tracks or large parcels that have parking uses even if it's accessory to the business next door. And then you'll see some of the gray that are still unclassified either because you haven't been able to figure out the use from driving by, sometimes you can't tell what's really going on inside a building, or just some gaps around it. But essentially, I'm going to try to walk you through the various districts to lead you to the recommendation. So if we can start with the next slide. And this is historical market. You generally see where two to three story buildings or some exceptions of taller buildings that are in the district, particularly the 1000 West Fulton building. But looking east, you see traditional market, the Republican on the right side of that image, um, and an industrial building to the west as you Go west along the district, you see that pattern of red brick buildings, roughly a three story being the dominant use, current all the way throughout the district. And obviously, it's an active district with a mix of uses. You have some residential in it, you have some commercial in it, you have some industrial in it, and that all seems to be coexisting currently in that immediate area. Uh, this is 1000 West Fulton, the Fulton Cold Storage Building. It is a transformative development in our minds because it will not only is it a very large building, uh, it is in the center of the area, it also will have as a tent Google, which brings a lot of excitement and a lot of employees to the area. It's anticipated this building will hold about 2,000 employees, which is a lot of new people coming to this area that can take advantage of the commercial spaces that are around the area. Um, to the north and west, closer to Ogden and Carroll, there are a series of very large buildings and very large parcels of land. And these all have relatively proximate access to Ogden, which if you recall leads to the two expressways. So this is an area where, as we'll see in a minute, was envisioned that perhaps some higher density development could occur, keeping it away from the historical market, also because with large tracts of land, you actually have the ability to try to execute on a larger development as opposed to having to buy 10 different parcels to assemble a plot. Um, this is residential. One of the surprises when we did the land use survey is the amount of residential. Generally speaking, most people envision the whole market area as being industrial. 
And as you can saw, saw, there's a lot of commercial in the area, but there's also a lot of residential that's been there, both in small scale, in terms of three-story buildings with the upper stories being uh, residential, but also some larger residential buildings that coexist immediately adjacent to industrial buildings and immediately adjacent to commercial uh, buildings. Generally speaking, to the north and kind of center of the area is most of the residential. Uh, this takes us to the north, kind of a, you know, the forgotten portion of this area, which is between the two railroad tracks, north of Carroll, south of Hubbard. That area has some traditional buildings in the red brick, roughly a three-story type of scale, and to its north, the viaduct at Hubbard really provides a natural buffer to the neighborhood north of that. That's the image to the south, which has a residential character with some commercial and some industrial mixed in, but has the, the large viaduct that runs along the south side of Hubbard, kind of buffering it from the uses to the south of that. Uh, Lake Street. Lake Street, from the perspective of the committee, is generally used as a service road. It provides access to many of the industrial uses in terms of loading docks. Uh, it has two-way traffic, which is a, not that common in this area. It is somewhat constrained by the fact that you have the L overhead, and so that creates some challenges as people try to not only get the traffic down the street, but also in terms of pedestrians. There's a proposal in one of the city plans to make this a bicycle route. You don't quite see how the bicycles, the cars, the trucks, and the train are all going to fit on Lake Street. But these are some images of Lake Street. You can see the industrial users using it for loading docks, people parking perpendicular to the street. Uh, and then at Morgan, when they just built the new CTA station, so the road really narrows and becomes just, sing just a single two lanes, one east and one west. Um, and lastly, Randolph Street. The Randolph Street has the character somewhat of a boulevard. It starts at Union Park at the west. It extends east to the Kennedy Expressway. Obviously, if you kept going east, you hit Millennium Park, going through the loop. It is a very wide street. It's 150 feet wide as a cross section, from private property line to private property line. Just so you get a sense of reference, that's bigger than Michigan Avenue, wider than Michigan Avenue, wider than State Street. It's one of the widest city streets in the city. It also has somewhat of a boulevard feel. It has the medians that protect the two center lanes, which are through lanes from the west, and then it has the two frontage roads, one on the north and one on the south. The southern one providing eastbound, an opportunity to go eastbound in terms of traffic, and the northern one providing an opportunity to go westbound in kind of a quieter environment. And they serve not only as loading areas for the businesses that are there, but a lot of the valley parking operations are on the frontages of Randolph Street, taking them off the main street. And there's obviously, as the restaurants have developed, a lot of sidewalk cafe and activities going on. In terms of the uses of Randolph, and this just takes you from Racine to Halston. The top map is the 1970 map, the bottom map is the 2013 map, and what you can see by the increase in red, red means a restaurant. So you, you can see what all of us know. A lot of restaurants have come into Randolph in the last 20, 30 years, and the area has really changed from a predominantly wholesale produce market, historic Randolph market, which is denoted in gray, to more of a restaurant, commercial strip as time has evolved over, over the years. Uh, Randolph Street has a variety of buildings, two stories, three stories, bricks, some taller buildings that were built many years ago. I call it the Marche building, I'm sure it has a better name than that, but that was the first restaurant that was there. So you see some taller buildings that appear along Randolph, as well as the smaller historic districts, uh, historic type buildings. You can also see the boulevard effect of Randolph provided by the uh, the major change in the area is probably the addition of the CTA station. Now there were previously CTA stations on, uh, on Lake Street. There was one in Halston that was taken down probably a couple decades ago. I believe there was one also on Morgan or somewhere further west that was also taken down for lack of use. Essentially, the use of those stations was down. They needed to be repaired. The city didn't see it justified to spend the money to repair them given their usage rates. But recently they discovered this area had been gaining more population. There was a need for increased public transit. So there was a believe, about a $40 million investment in building a new CTA station that resources the green and pink lines, giving you quick access to the loop, access south to the south of the UIC Rush campus, uh, right at Morgan. This influenced the area because I'm, I, many of you may have heard of TOD, transit-oriented development. So the idea here is 
If you're going to create density, try to create it near the trains to try to stimulate people to use public transportation as opposed to their cars. Fewer cars, obviously, means fewer traffic on the street. Now, generally, TOD is viewed as circles from the center of the train station. And generally, most of the literature talks about quarter mile. So a quarter mile from the train station seems to be about the average tolerance for any of us to walk to get to a train. The city has developed two kind of measures. 600 feet is a standard city rule for TOD, transit-oriented development, where parking can be reduced, where densities can be increased. In certain cases, they go to the 1,200 foot, which is more closer to that quarter mile, typically on pedestrian streets, right? None of these are pedestrian streets in the area, but we wanted to show you the extent of that quarter mile range, which goes as far north as Kinsey, and as far south, really almost as Washington, uh, and uh, east almost to Halstead and west to Racine. So that's the area if you use that quarter mile range that that L theoretically would draw people from and would be able to support greater density and lower automobile use. And as a side note, the city in their plan had that TOD area as a rectangular box along Lake Street, if you remember, this area would have been the Concentric circles because if you're walking that quarter mile, it's a, it could be a circular, obviously, any direction a quarter mile. So, this is the first thing that we looked at and started to formulate our plan. Yeah, the city kind of looked at the transit oriented high density just east west corridor along Lake Street. We really, we really didn't look at it as a circle because people will walk four blocks from any direction. So, that took us to the WCA proposal, uh, which has some differences and some similarities to the city. So starting with, and I think some of you can have this as the handout, I'll start at the historic Lake Market. Essentially, it's the same proposal that the city has. Keep that as a C3, keep it as a dash one, keep low density in that area where traditionally Fulton Market has existed. Uh, taking you immediately south of it, you see a C23 denoted by the green bubble at the bottom here. That is kind of the area that the city talked about in terms of being high density. Because of the constraints on Lake Street, because it's adjacent to historic Old Market, the committee felt that this was not the area for the big tall buildings. First of all, it starts to crowd historic Old Market to try to preserve that area, keep its two, three-story character, and then going to build a 15-story building immediately adjacent, or theoretically find the, find the area with it. Second of all, Lake Street, as I said earlier, has some challenges in terms of trying to get traffic. Uh, and lots of volume down it. It's two way, it's fairly narrow. Thirdly, a parcel size. So the ownership of blocks, there's not a lot of large blocks owned by single owners in this area. It's mostly smaller individual owners, and that makes it a little harder to assemble and actually get a larger development. And if you recall from the historic plan, the historic map kind of cuts this area and actually limits the ability to execute on the city's own proposal in terms of high density, because I can't simultaneously keep the two, three-story buildings that are there and build a 15-story building. So the thought was, keep this as a C2, that would allow residential, but as a dash three type zoning, which is sort of a three to five story uh, range of, of uses here, permitting commercial, permitting industrial, and permitting residential. Going west, the area that is today a manufacturing area, this is the innovative industries, district as labeled by the city, and extending north to the Kinsey Corridor, which is the PMD area today, again, innovative industries as labeled by the city. We try to flush that out more and say, if you're really talking about innovative industries, if you're really talking about an office-type commercial use, then you should have the land use to match that and not go with the manufacturing type of use, which really evokes a different type of use. The western portion, because it's proximate to Ogden, because it has larger parcels, and because historically it's had larger buildings over there, uh, the committee saw as a higher density district, that's the dash five uh, notation there. And then as you go north to the Kinsey Carroll Hubbard corridor, you have a similar type of use pattern, but at a lower density, which is consistent with the buildings that are there today, which tend to be the two, three, four story type buildings. Lastly, Randolph. Randolph is viewed as a the main thoroughfare for this area. It's a southern boundary, as I said earlier, it's a very wide street, it has some advantages from a transportation perspective. Uh, the committee doesn't 
understand why the zoning is split down the middle of it, with downtown zoning to the south, the commercial zoning to the north, even though the zonings are, are similar in their requirements, the idea was to have it be one homogeneous district that has the kind of uses that we see today, the commercial uses, uh, and perhaps at a higher density than in Vision. So essentially moving the density that the city envisioned along Lake Street, moving it somewhat west to the area that's closer to the Little Ogden, and moving it south to Randolph, which is a very wide street, creates a lot of separation from the other side of the street, also takes it a little further away from the historic old market area. So that's a very quick summary of our plan, the, the basis for the plan, we're going to welcome all the comments that uh, you have to try to inform and refine this plan. And now I'm going to switch places with Michael and Cass will switch places with me as he takes you through the landmark presentation. Um, in the neighborhood. 
So it's pretty significant because, as, um, as Rolando said, it takes in what is essentially the first five blocks of Randolph Street as you come across Halstead. Um, and what that means is that um, despite what it says on the land use map, it's going to be very difficult to modify in any significant way those structures. Um, many of them are small buildings and small ownership, but there's some very large parcels here. And, um, you know, I think there's a, a question as to, to whether or not this is the best way to preserve the historic buildings that are there. Um, these are the kinds of things that they look at when they're reviewing um, any permit applications, um, specifically, um, ex primarily exterior, and I think they reassured us that they're not interested in the interior of structures, but um, the outside is what's important. So changes to any of these elements on any existing buildings would have to go through historic review. Um, they typically reference the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines for rehabilitating historic buildings. Um, and uh, those standards are very specific. That any, any part of a historic building um, or a building that's a contributing uh, building within a historic district that you touch, um, regardless of what it is today, um, you would be expected to make that piece more historic. So for example, if there are window, if it's a historic building like the Neely Foods building, and um, there are windows here that you can see have been blocked up in the past, if Neely decides that they want to unblock those windows, um, there will be a standard, which is that they you would need to as closely as possible replicate the windows that were already there um, or that were there originally. Um, this is a. a a piece that I, I borrowed from um, my friend Alan Johnson across the historic advisors um, on projects that where we're involved with historic buildings is now pretty much the reward to get um, someone like Alan involved to, to deal with um, the city's department of landmarks and all of the other um, elements. Um, it's they're very efficient at what they do, but it is one more consultant that you end up with on a project. Um, he provided this because he prepared this for um, the River North District when that was proposed. Um, so what's restricted is you know, demolition, new construction, alterations to historic features, etc., all subject to review. Uh, the commission review is typically confined to exterior elevations, view visible from the public right of way, although I point out that any addition of floor area to a building would, would obviously, in most cases with small buildings, be visible from the public right of way. So those buildings are pretty much limited to the height they are now. Um, the commission has veto power over demolition, so if for some reason somebody wants to take down a building, they can prevent issuance of a, of a demolition permit. And for major alterations, there are, there's a likelihood of time delays and added costs to paying permits. Um, the opportunities are that, that, that landmarking presents is that um, it recognizes the historic and architectural significance of a building or district and its importance to the history of the community. So there's a certain perceived status in that. Um, that landmark designation protects the buildings from alterations and demolition and owners of landmark properties can utilize economic incentives to offset the cost of repair rehabilitation. Um, we'll see some more about that on the, on the next slide. Um, these are the incentives that, that, that the city can provide. The first would be a Class L property designation. Um, that allows a reduction in taxes on any commercial property for 12 years. Does that typically apply to residential properties? A commercial user would apply to have taxes reduced. However, it's not frankly a very, it's not a simple process and it's by no means automatic. There's a pretty extensive application um, process and I, some of the attorneys in the audience probably have a lot better experience with that part of it than I do. But for example, you have to prove up, uh, I think, you know, minimum federal wage for all employees employed at the site, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, a series of, of tests that you go through um, before they would grant this particular status. 
Um, the city can waive permit fees for, um, for buildings, and um, there's a property tax assessment freeze for historic residences. That really only applies to single family homes, so that's not particularly applicable here. Um, there's a 20% federal historic rehabilitation tax credit. Um, the simple fact is that that is not something the city offers, that's a federal program. Um, we have been involved in quite a number of, of landmark buildings that have been done utilizing the federal tax credits. City landmark status does not equate to federal landmark status. Um, you can be a city landmark and not be qualified as a federal landmark. To be qualified as a federal landmark, you need to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places or be in a district that is listed on the National Register. I think the city intends to, after landmarking this area, try to put it on a federal landmark, uh, you know, the list of historic places, but that's by no means a guaranteed step because the criteria are frankly um, much stiffer become federal to get a federal landmark listing. Interestingly enough, you can you can be on the federal register and not be a city landmark. The building that we're in at 900 Lake Street is on the National Register of Historic Places already. So city status there does not really confer for us any additional advantages. Um, and then there's a facade easement donation. If you're on the federal register, you can donate the facade of your building to a not-for-profit um, or a charitable organization and they can, um, and you can take a tax deduction for that. It's typically not a vast amount of money and again, it's rather difficult to get. Um, this, I think, is, is informative because like the previous uh, presentation that Rolando made, I think many of us were somewhat surprised when we tried to map the uses that already exist in this community to see really how mixed it is. Um, you know, when you look at the zoning map, it looks quite simple. This area is manufacturing, this area is commercial, but the reality on the ground is, is a very different thing. Um, and, you know, perhaps just because I've been here a long time, this could be tried to find out the mixed uses of that. There are occasional frustrations when there's a semi blocking our driveway or something, but I think what we've learned is that, that those are all problems that are solved by talking to people. So what we have here is a very mixed group of buildings and everything within the black line here will become um, part of the historic district. Um, there is, if you receive the letter and you read the fine print, there's a request that, or there's mention of the fact that if they study this district and they go back to um, the commission and the commission decides to make this a district, they then send you another letter that asks for your consent. Um, the simple fact is that you can dissent, but it only matters if 51% of the owners dissent. And frankly, that also, next slide. Um, you can see here at the, at the bottom in the dark, I kind of highlighted, if 51% of the owners of a property in the district responding to the request for consent file, written objections of designation, uh, a recommended landmark designation of that district must be approved by six members of the commission. Um, well, since the members of the commission are all appointed by the mayor, I think you know that's more or less a foregone conclusion. But um, but there is a, there is actually one um, proposed. I was only able to find the one district that had been proposed and not been adopted, and that was in River North, um, probably about a decade ago. Some of you may remember. Um, and in that case, um, the major property owners, I think, organized by Albert Freeman, who owns a lot of property there, did object, um, and the commission um, did not adopt that district. And River North seems to still have a lot of historic buildings and seems to be doing just fine. Um, and there are some teeth to this ordinance which people need to be aware of. Um, basically, you know, if, if you neglect to get approval by the commission uh, and do work to your building, um, that's regarded as a violation just like any other violation under the building code. Next. 
and um, obviously there are fines potentially attached to that. Um, each day is a separate offense, so if it's a building project, these tend to take a long time. It could be a lot of days. They can fine you five hundred to thousand dollars a day for any any such violation. So um, if we do become a district, it's going to be really important for people to follow follow the lines and, and, and you know cross all the T's and dot all the I's. Um, I would strongly recommend it if you're contemplating any kind of serious work to a building that you get consultants involved who are familiar with this process and there's other people than Alan Johnson but he's very good at it. Yes. So I know we all have a sporting event we'd like to look at. Any questions? Pat, thank you very much, Orlando. Um, you know, I want to acknowledge and recognize our uh, our Randolph Fulton Market uh, Plan Committee. Uh, we put in a lot, a lot of time. Um, I really appreciate that, um, but we're not done. We're really not done. So uh, we really do want to hear from you. Um, I think the theme to this meeting was how this plan affects you. And um, you know, really want to, really do want to hear from you. We'd like for you to work with us, to join us. Um, so at this time, we really would like to open up to open it up to some questions. Uh, as you can see, our panel is here. So who would like to uh, go first? Go ahead, Terry. Hi, uh, I'm Terry Barton. I, I don't live there. I used to live there, and now I live over in Kansas. Over in the U.S. and Kansas. But I work there. Two main streets, 
And, you know, we are not advocating for a bunch of tall buildings on Randolph. However, if it's significant, if it's significant to the area, to the neighborhood, then, you know, we would be more open to it. I think, you know, generally our plan is not as restrictive as the city's. Uh, but given the width of the street, along with some other reasons, which Delando detailed very clearly, um, we're open to a little more density on right now. Uh, Alderman, did you have something to say? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand, sorry. I think it would be good to know the people uh, live along <coughs> If you don't mind uh, just stating where you uh, live, where, you're, where you work, you're a property owner, I'd like to hear more from you, just know who you are, um, you know, what your interests are, and so forth. So, yes? the historic importance of a lot of the buildings that are there. 
I think that um, you know, the, the, one of the reasons we're so affected here is, you know, it is so close to downtown, but it's been preserved for so long uh, with, with a lot of character. And, and um, we try, you know, as a company, I'm speaking really as, as a company right now, uh, you know, we, we honor the architecture that's there, the buildings that are there, and we try and preserve as much as we can. Um, this area was thriving way before we showed up. You know, this is, uh, the restaurants have been there for a long time. The, 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 uh, a lot of the traditional users have been moving out way before we got there. We, we hope they, you know, we don't want them all to leave. You know, we, uh, we, we think it's important to the personality of the neighborhood that they, they remain. So when we talk about Randolph, when we talk about Fulton, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a ton of, of things that need to stay. Um, but I think that any neighborhood that doesn't continue to progress and grow um, eventually shrivels. So I think that, again, we're so close to the Central Business District that naturally, and it's really our whole city that's growing, you know, you know, you see many neighborhoods growing. Um, I think that we need to um, be true to the neighborhood and, and let it grow in the way that in a natural fashion. It's a very good point um, because uh, we also want to retain the character of the neighborhood. We like it the way it is. So, you know, I, I want to be very clear about that. I mean, and, and obviously, Scott, you know, agrees with that. So, we are not the let's radically change the neighborhood uh, group. That's not, that's not the way out. But, but at the same time, we do have this economic engine that is bringing a lot of jobs to the city uh, right now. It's something we really need and we want to try to find a way So we're, as the, as the economic community group in the Area West Central Association, we've been chartered with the city as a delegate agency to try to continue to promote economic growth in a responsible way that fits in with the character. So why wouldn't we, we look at this and say, we have a good thing happening here. Let's figure out ways to work with the different community groups, work with the people that are here, but to, to facilitate that it continues sort of this growth and this this, this job creators. When, when I talk to the restaurant owners up and down Randolph Street, they'd like to see a little more density. When I talk to residents, they say we wish we had a little more services. And you know, you can talk to Sir Bay in terms of what it takes to bring in these retailers. You need a little bit of density in the right spots in order to get the services. And I'm not saying anything that you don't know. So how can we do this in a in a thoughtful, productive, and encouraging way to continue the growth uh, and to continue to bring more services? to the area, and, and that's really what we're trying to look at in a big picture. And we're being mindful of various industries. I think Tom said it best. You know, he said, we, uh, Tom, uh, we can coexist. You know, we have various uses, various companies, um, meat packers, and we have restaurants, and we can, we can make this work. So we'd like to hear more from you, actually. So who's next? Actually, 
is uh, addressing uh, Skinner. Now, I'm on the local school council for Skinner, um, and I know that, um, I'll tell you, that uh, Alderman Burnett is, yeah, he is very well aware, and we, we have a lot of dialogue. We know of the problem, um, and, you know, keep in mind, we have Pat Fitzgerald here, um, who designed Arcadia, uh, but actually, they, they made quite a sizable donation uh, to Skinner. I think it's something like 125000 but it's a drop in the bucket for what we need for an expansion. We were, you know, that, trust me, that's high on our priority list, but, you know, kind of, we're, we're here to talk about that whole amount of market. We do have some ideas about ways to, we do have, we do have some really good thoughts about that. We're starting to talk to some of the community. I mean, obviously, we'll, for Armando, put his one of his mouth when he says, about Skinner because he spends a lot of time uh, on it, so your work is to be kind of uh, Armando. But, you know, first of all, uh, many of the uses that we talk about in terms of development aren't, it's, you know, the guys here aren't necessarily all the residential, I mean, it's still the data that's more commercial. Nevertheless, uh, we've been looking at a way to, in the zoning code to allow for uh, bonuses to be available. That there are bonuses that you can, that developers, when they come in and do projects, in a DX10, for example, you can receive a bonus for your FAR by making a contribution to the public school system. And that bonus isn't allowed in a lower, we don't have very much DX10 in our area. That, that bonus isn't allowed in a DX7 or DX5 right now. And that could be changed with a, with a tax amendment. And so that is something that we're actually, as our group, and we've started to talk to Mel and to West Loop and the organization about, and, and we all have to come up with a way that, that we might get an end with that. So there, we do have other ideas going on. Obviously, we are here, though, talking about this this area. But that is a very good point, and it's something we're thinking of. Uh, Thanks for shining a light on the issue of that. So I would, you know, of course, I have to be concerned about all of this. I can't just have all of the only the Skinner schools because they're around the government to get all the money. I got to be concerned about all the schools in the war. But also, uh, um, you all didn't make a recommendation for the uh, landmark. That was the day y'all don't recommend. What happened to them? Okay, Tom, you want to speak to that? Yeah, Tom was very passionate. Um, yeah. We originally did not, in our letter to uh, the alderman and to the Department of Planning, uh, make any recommendation because at that time, when we saw the presentation April 1st, which many of you were there, because I remember the faces, uh, we didn't have enough information. And we still don't, frankly. But we do know that as a group, as a committee, that having a historic district, the size and the and the uh, configuration that's being proposed by the city is not good. It's not going to promote, further promote economic development. It will adversely affect property owners because of their compliance requirements. It's a two-stage effect or two-step uh, proposal, one at the city level that will get approved quickly and over your objection unless you come together and tell the city you don't want it. You need 51%. They did it in River North. Why can't we do it in West Loop? So we are not in support of the historic district. Are there buildings that are historical? Are there buildings that we would like to see retain and maintain? Absolutely. Get them on a different register. But don't blanket our area with a historic designation that puts handcuffs on the very development that we're seeing. And I'll speak why I speak passionately. I'll speak as a property owner. I don't want it. I wouldn't want to be dictated to me what I'm going to do with my property going forward and go in front of a committee or a panel and have it approved or not approved. I don't want to be told I can't put down my building. I don't want to be told that I can't build another one. If you go in the historic landmark area, that's going to take place. Now, I'm not the expert. We asked Pat to be the expert for us. But sitting here and hearing what I did on April 1st, 
and hearing what I have heard today and all along in our committee, I assure you that the property owner I can understand why you want it. Also, if you want it because you want protection, you feel that this is your way to use the city to protect your current use and the operation that you have and get out from dealing with a resident complaining over here or a commercial use over here, they're making a big mistake. We coexisted with residential on three sides of us as an operating manufacturing company. And we had four trucks out on the street, and we had big, huge ductworks sitting on the street. And we had semi-trailers loading at four in the morning. Did we get complaints? Yes, we did. From a residential development, many of which were on the sides. But we worked with them. We didn't stop them from going in. Because being a member of the West Central Association for three decades, we promote economic development. We believe that we can all coexist. We do in our economic development committee. We support those very projects that everybody steps back and say, how could they do such a thing? But then when they're done, instead of being fools, we're visionaries. We're not visionaries any more than you are. We believe in the community and we know what we believe in our hearts will work. Open cold storage isn't unique. It was just a matter of time. We've been on Fulton Street for 60 years, or since 1960. Fulton cold storage was over, going to happen. Whether it be Sterling Bay or someone else, it was going to happen. Adaptive reuse is going to take place. It, it's just a matter of time. And what are we getting? We're getting Google. And we're getting other technology people. We're bringing in jobs. And we're bringing in density that will do what? Bring more restaurants, bring some hotels. Bad word, hotel, but I don't want one next to me. Put one next to me, I'll take it. Because you work with that. All of that will help all of us I'm passionate because it affects our pocketbook. If you have it here in the first, third, second, third, fourth generation of ownership, there's people on Fulton Street that have owned it for 100 plus years. Do not let operational problems that can all be managed dictate to you what you're going to get from your families in the future. Just don't do it. Work with organizations like the West Central Association. If you're already a member of an association, the one before that are primarily in this area that are on the mention, work with that. We're not looking for you to jump ship and join us, but if you're not happy, come on board. But if you are, work with your own organization and address these issues. So historic landmark, not, not being done like this. Well said, well said. Ken? Um, Ken Monroe, uh, with Washington. Um, okay, WCA has said that, have you guys um, talked to the landmarked area and asked these businesses if they want to be in or out? And if they want to be out, I gotta think that there's at least
educate people about this. That is really up to every individual property owner. I don't need education about it. I think most people here don't need an education about the facade of their building. Because it's all about the facade. It's not the interior. It's not the typical historic landmark. I think most of us don't want to be hassled with this historic landmarking. And if we all get together and join forces, we should be able to come up with a 51% or better. So all I'm asking for is all the groups, even my group, uh, neighbors of West Blue Park, we deal mostly with residents, um, come together, find out who doesn't want this, and let's get that letter going, petition going, whatever the terminology is, to get it done. There's, I've only heard negative about this stuff. Nobody really wants this designation. Tonight's the first start of this, and so absolutely 100% agree. And now that you know our position, I mean, I want to hear from you. Do you, do you agree? I don't want to show pants who, who, want, who wants to be in the store and designate uh, the businesses that are here, uh, and the property owners that are here. Are there any that want to be in the store and then agree with them? Ah, that's okay, so, so, right. so you agree with us. Great. We are reaching out. We are reaching out uh, and have uh, communicated with the other three major associations in the area, Wilco, Noel, and RFMA. And we as an organization, the West Central, is contacting them and asking to get together and talk about the land use plan and where we agree and may not agree and why not and work through that and to talk about the historic a district designation. I asked Pat specifically when we got into this, how do we stop? That's the question to be asked. And you asked, how do we stop it? He said, it can only happen once in the history that he knows of in the city of Chicago. It happened in River North, and it's because some large landowners got together and then got all the other landowners, not as large, it doesn't matter if you own land, you have a voice. And they got them together, and they got the 50 per, 51 percent that was needed, as well as the phone calls to the alderman. I'm sorry, Alderman Burnett, may your phone ring off the book. He <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was up to the alderman to, and he told us when we met, help him, help him, help us. So we, he needs to hear from us. I'm telling you, the first meeting that we had with the alderman, he looked at our plan and he said, let me hear from the property owners. Get the property owners to speak. Because if they don't, planning is going to approve the landmark districting and they're going to get this land use plan approved. The alderman is there for us. He's got to hear from us. He's got to hear from all of us. So contact your association that you're a member of. Let them know what your position is. If you're not a member of it, you can join us. But be heard. And we're actively trying to reach and contact uh, the landowners. Not as easy as you think, but we're doing that on, a, a, on an ongoing basis. So if some of you are here and have been able to contact you, establish contact with you, please please uh, let us know. Which the TOD does reach on the east, 
Now, because of the character of that area, you want to try to preserve as far as scale. So maybe you don't do you know, TOD over in that area. Uh, Lake Street, I think the reasons have been stated, itself, Lake Street is very congested. So maybe that's not exactly the site of the TOD, but it's one block off or a half a block off to account for better transit opportunities. And then areas to the west, as you notice, may be outside of the range, but they have other features like Ogden, which does provide a thoroughfare, so it will support some higher developments. It's kind of a guideline, but you don't have to have a public circle. And in this case, you almost can't have it by definition because of what's happening on Fulton Market Street itself in the east. But there's clearly some different things, depending on the land uses on the ground, physical attributes, and then we have, I think Scott said at one of the meetings, if you want to have to be, you want to take advantage of the L, but it doesn't mean you have to be exactly on the L, because in this case, being exactly on the L probably creates some transportation challenges. Yeah, I'm just you know, concerned that the response that you might get, you know, especially with Lake Street, I think, uh, being such an important artery going into the city, you know, perhaps a little bit more thought given to Lake Street specifically, instead of it being sort of designated, oh, this is just, um, I guess, the loading down Part of the idea of this meeting is to get input like that and refine the thinking, sort of give you enough information so that you can generate some ideas and some questions for us as, as we move through the process. Jim, you had a question? Uh, I had a question about the statement regarding landmark and historic district. Uh, I'm in the process of a landmark situation now in the South Loop, and it's just a difficult process. Uh, they have to start concerned with the side, and you, and you go through the ring to try to make this work. And it's restricted once once it's established. So I'm concerned about doing it in, in such a large scale here in this neighborhood. It'll restrict the use of property. Once that happens, forget about going two stories or one story or looking at better density for properties, and, and that's going to adjust values. So I think that sets up some important consideration to do. Uh, obviously, responsible development is always helpful. This, this, what, where we're here, this is a product that we put together and developed this from a, uh, a old warehouse that was dilapidated and we put together a great looking product. So responsible development happens without having restrictions from something like this. So I think we need to stand up and, and take our voices first. And it's not something that we look forward to to have this restrictive program for landmarks in such a large, large area. I think it will be, it will definitely create different values for the properties. We always think about it in terms of a reuse of a building, but I want to actually met with an existing industrial user who two years ago cut a new loading dock into the facade of his building because it facilitated his operations internally. Now, if that building had been landmarked, there's no way he's getting that new loading dock. So it's even hurting the existing industrial users that arguably they're trying to protect. Because if you need to bring in new loading docks, new windows, closed windows, modify your your facade to accommodate your interior, you gotta go through a process. The, now the, third parties gonna say the no. The look of the front of this building wouldn't have been able to be done the way we put it together, just because it wouldn't fit in with what it was. And, and I, I think the owners here enjoy the, this product, right? So it, we need the flexibility to be able to develop something that's quality and doesn't have to be strict to what you know landmark insists on. I think we could be responsible owners and developers. And that's why our plan isn't as restrictive. I mean, this this is about looking into the future and doing what makes sense. And um, quite frankly, we feel that the city's plan, I think, um, limits the further growth in the area. Go, oh, Mark. Uh, Mark Brown was Lake Street Lofts. Uh, not to be confused with this by the silver. We're at 900 Lake Street. And uh, to amplify the word tonight, Tom, you put it best, is that I wish y'all didn't, didn't duck out because one of the things he's mentioned uh, over the last year especially is he feels the way, and I, I believe uh, most people would agree with me, is that every project for whatever parcel is an individual circumstance. It's not set in stone that our parking lot is going to remain a historic parking lot next to our building because of this artificial designation that's been thrown out. And likewise, if um, whatever proposal comes to the community, the whole community has say-so, it's a process. And I think it's worked very well. 
As Pat pointed out, Madison RAC blends in nicely with the landscape that, it, that it's around. Even though it's the newest kid on the block, it's not a distraction. Arcadia blends in with the landscape on the east side of Halstead Street. I'm sure Michael uh, will, on the Wolf will uh, argue that their proposed project uh, right down the street from Arcadia will also blend in with the existing landscape because everything has been, everything has been done individually, not, uh, not a rash action. And that way, if you're going to move forward, uh, thinking of the future, as Armando knows, well, how are you going to do that if you have a building that's equivalent to a parking garage be landlocked to be a parking garage forever? So it's time to start speaking with all the neighbors who, are, who have property in this area. And really, I think 51% is going to get the notice. They're going to think I'd get closer to two-thirds of the bus. And once that goes and steamrolls further, that particular outlook that the neighborhoods may have a future that could be something that we're not even thinking about today. That could be a darn right we think of that before. It would be restricted because of this. And that's managing, I could say it's managing the building for 14 years. That's one of the oldest existing structures in this whole neighborhood. For 128 years, it had a revitalized use after a one time kind of being condemned that it may have been kind of standing for so it's, it's a very good argument from both sides of the point, but it doesn't need to be landlocked that we can't move forward with any property. So, great points, Mark. And one of the things that uh, one of the guys that's not here on our panel <coughs> tonight, who's been part of our committee, is uh, Oak Ridge Associates, this guy named George Kissel. And, and Oak Ridge is a land planner. They've been doing work in the city of Chicago for years. They've worked for Wilco in the past, and they're working with us right now to help us formulate some of our thinking. They uh, recently did a land plan for the Nobu Hotel, and Nobu shared that with us for use. And it's something that we have that we sent out to the guys at uh, Wilco and Nowell and uh, Rathma. And we have it that, that for anyone that's interested in looking at this land plan. It, it's very interesting because it talks a lot about what you talked about in terms of how we approach zoning in our area, how we've looked at uh, project by project based zoning, and how organically this area has become great, and a lot of it is historically in this plan, and I think it's also a roadmap for future development, as you, as you point out. So we have this, it's guided our thinking, if anyone wants to see the plan, um, obviously there can be all kinds of follow-up tonight, you can have our contact information. Uh, but, but this NOBU report uh, talking about uh, some of these things uh, was very interesting from over in the Associates. Now it is getting into that. Okay, just for a second. Sure. John Newrider, uh, Amber McGurry. I'm actually immediately out of this um, and out of the uh, out of the current landmark status. But you know, we've, we've only been at the current landmark in Halstead. We've been at that spot for about four years. And so we're sort of new on the block. Um, but <coughs> at the time we were building, Girl and Girl was building. Since then, Little Go went up. And you know, and all the other, like Ocean Ball, and you know, just go, go down the road, look at all the places. Um, Take a trip back seven, eight years ago and drive down the same strip, and it it will it will You know there was there was red light marche and everything else was kind of you know industrial you know uh, fruit market storefront. So if you had frozen it then, which is kind of what the purpose of a historic designation would be, that's essentially where it's going. And the, the reason that strip looks so great is all the development you know within the last ten years has happened. So that's going to happen on every single one of those you know of those thoroughfares that are. So I think it's important staying with Randolph, I think Randolph has a, that his potential. I think there's a lot of opportunity on, on Randolph. Um, and I really, really hope that, um, you know, again, that this plan doesn't slow that down. Hi there, David Campbell, uh, resident. Um, so what's been the feedback from the city? I mean, you've been meeting with them. Are you getting any traction, blowback? Well, we had a, uh, a good long meeting with, with the city, and um, you know they're being, I would say, um, slow to come around. Um, I think we made some progress, some of which I shared with you prior to getting into this presentation. Um, but they still need to hear more from us. I mean, part of our problem is that you know we're maybe not being loud enough. Um, 
And you know, this this meeting tonight was about getting to you know you getting to know our position and our vision for the area. Um, and you know, we really would like to know if, if, if you agree with us. If you do, I hope that you do. Um, we hope that you will become more vocal. Um, and if you don't agree with us, we're we're receptive. We're open to getting your thoughts. Um, certainly, comment on ladies. Great, great ad. Um, but uh, there's still a lot more work to do. They, I think they've been uh, not the most open to suggestions. Um, but certainly, uh, I think Alderman left, but um, he was helpful in somewhat brokering that meeting. Um, so we, we did have a long meeting and we agreed to disagree on some issues. Um, but we're still, you know, we're still working on it. And you know, to, to have a uh, landmark vote two days after the uh, meeting uh, that, that they had, I think was it uh, April 1st, and then two days later we're going to have a vote for the vote. Uh, really? Okay, so much for being open and transparent. Um, but Tom, sorry. I'll expand on uh, Armando's response, but a little bit differently. And I like your wording uh, better. If we don't come together and unify, what the city is proposing will get approved. One of the reasons, or the reason, we're having this community meeting, if you will, and we used uh, the, we sent out emails, not only using our own database, we use real estate companies, we use other associations to get the word out. And I encourage you, if you're not sitting next to your neighbor, or if there's property owners that are not here, pick up the phone to our downtown. If the alderman does not hear from the property owner and the department of planning does not hear an outcry from us, from the associations as well as the property owners individually, this will be approved. So I encourage you, work through the associations that you're presently a member of, join those that you're not if you want to have that representation. Work independently, however you want to do it. If they do not hear from us, this plan will be approved both the landmarking, uh, historic district landmarking, as well as the land use. When we met with the city, we asked them, why are you doing this? The area has been developing on its own. The alderman, along with the Department of Planning, have been thoughtful, have been responsible, and the developers have brought sustainable developments to our neighborhood. And they said if it's the job of the city, it's the job of the Department of Planning to develop guidelines and a plan to promote and encourage development, future development and job growth. And personally, my response to that is the guidelines that you're establishing are too restrictive and they're not going to promote and encourage, but they're going to stop what has already been happening. And we're asking you respectively to broaden the guidelines to that which we are proposing. And if you are in agreement, we're going to ask you to get join us in contacting the city writing the letters that you have to write, we'll prepare a sample letter, I've already written my own, and, this, and email it to everybody that's in this room to get the letter writing and get the office and get the department of planning to hear us. So, how far did we get? Not very far. Yeah, 
the West Central Association has always been to look at the West Loop as a whole. And it, we may not have a lot of membership in a given area of owners, but that doesn't mean we don't contact the city and tell them what we believe should be done. If you own property in the city of Chicago, if you're a business in the city of Chicago, you pay tax dollars, you, you employ people, and you bring revenue. You can, your voice will be heard. So you don't, do not have to be to answer your question within the plan area itself.